And yeah, so we're really excited and let's begin. So now we'll move on to our, our next great uh, presenter. Uh, I'm really excited to have Sholon Stanley Vasquez from Santa Rosa Junior College present her project, Bringing Immigration Stories to Life Through Innovative Technologies. So over to you, Sholon, and if you can uh, share your screen, thank you. Green. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for being here on a Saturday morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Sholon Stanley Vasquez, and I teach sociology at the Santa Rosa Junior College. My goal in my EPIC project was to teach a global topic, Circassians forced displacement from the Russian empire to the Ottoman empire in the 19th century to community college students. Using this somewhat distant and little known case study, I also talk broadly about human migration and the concept of home, hence the home within project. To tell the story, I've decided to create a website utilizing digital, digital history as a method. And a brief definition of digital history can be um, using digital technologies to create, enhance, or share historic, historical scholarship. Mine is um, an amateur's dabbling in digital history, as I like to call it. Um, so uh, kind of a humble project. But um, I want to pop the um, link also for the website in the chat, if I can find it again. <laughs> Sorry. This never works out the way you intended to, does it? I, okay, here we go. Here's the website if every, anyone wants to take a look at it as um, I'm doing the presentation. Uh, but I also give you snapshots or screenshots um, of the, the website as well. Sorry. Okay, here we go. So, um, oh, I actually want to start with a uh, video. And um, this is a video I've created on Google Earth. Um, I've created a project on Google Earth and recorded it on Screencast-O-Matic, so um, I the, which added the music, et cetera, which should this should give you a br um, brief background of what I'm talking about. Turning to the PowerPoint. I, I really owe a debt of gratitude to Vladimir um, Hamid Tryansky, who's here today with us, um, somewhere in the audience, who, whose his amazing historical um, uh, scholarship constitutes the backbone of my, um, of my site. And um, thank you so much, uh, Vladimir, for sharing your research and your deep and rich scholarship. And um, Vladimir is a recent graduate from Stanford and currently at UC Santa Barbara. UC Santa Barbara. Um, here are some, again, screenshots from my um, website. I promised Faiza I wouldn't scroll, so I'm trying to keep my promise here. So in my project, I first talk about Circassian exile and its historical significance. 
Yesterday, May 21st, uh, was the 157th anniversary of the Circassian exile, a day that's been chosen as the Circassian Day of Mourning. Here, I would like to acknowledge and honor all victims of Circassian displacement, but also all victims of forced migration and displacement from Native Americans to Africans who have been shipped across the Atlantic, from Armenians and Palestinians to internally displaced Kurds in Turkey, from Latin Americans to Syrians who are escaping violence and instability in their home countries. This project is really dedicated to them. On my site, I cover topics of migration and displacement broadly, defining key concepts and giving examples from the past as well as the present and focus on the Middle East and the US. I also share my family's story. My grand great grandparents lived through the Circassian expulsions from Caucasia. My grandmother never met her father and I tell that story. I found my great grandfather's name on Wikipedia, which I can explain in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, and I believe the home my grandmother always carried within her was her childhood home in Hatupkyu, um, at Circassian village. Here I, I am as a teenager sitting next to the hazelnut harvest in front of her home within. I argue in this project that there's a home, home all migrants carry within them as a place we'd like to one day return to or the place we think of when we're homesick. And I include myself here as an immigrant to the US from Turkey as well. I present a broad summary of the status of minorities, ethnic minorities in Turkey. I present the Circassian culture. And I embark upon a feminist, anti-racist and anti-orientalist evaluation of women's place in Circassian culture. During my time here at Stanford, and thanks to our fearless SESTA leaders, Faiza Parviz and Nelson Schumacher and Debo, I'm now a huge digital history fan and enthusiast. Um, I've included these resources on my website. I strongly urge you all to check out these amazing resources and use them in your teaching. Stanford's Chinese Railroad Workers Project is one of them. Um, there are fascinating digital history projects on the Braceros, as well as on slavery, also included on my website. This year, following Nelson's kind invitation, I've also um, joined Stanford's Life in Quarantine project as a collaborator. The project collects pandemic stories from all over the globe. I've written a few assignment templates for how this project can be used in teaching at the undergraduate level. And finally, I'm fully committed to decolonizing my thinking and applying anti-racism to my life in teaching. So here are some other resources you can look at, um, which are all uh, listed on my website. So why should you consider using digital history as a teaching tool? Well, number one, it's an excellent forum. It's a public forum, open access, to showcase your rigorous academic research. Second, perusing a website like this is visually and viscerally engaging. Um, I, I hope you'll agree with me than reading an academic paper or textbook for our students. And this kind of engagement has the potential to activate our students to become agents of social change. It's also more interactive and collaborative. It's self-directed, self-paced. It appeals to different learning styles. Visitors can choose to view the videos or check out the Earth, Google Earth projects, get lost in the hyperlinks, or share their own migration story. In fact, I've essentially designed my page as a blueprint that others can use as a model for their own sites. Here's a Google form that migrants can fill out if they'd like to collaborate with me. And here's a template interview form for my students who may want to interview um, their families about their migration stories. In the future, I hope to collaborate with my students on their own home within projects where stories of their families from different parts of the world are told. This temp template is for the Philippines. This is an accessible format. After reviewing a few options, including Medium, Wic, WordPress, and Story Maps, I've chosen Google Sites. Its perks include it's free, and in that sense, everybody can use it and create their own projects. It's user-friendly. 
I didn't find it to be glitchy. And let me tell you, I'm not a technical whiz. So if I was able to do this, anybody can. It works well with other Google products. And ADA accessibility is already built in as long as you enter the alt text, et cetera. And finally, it, it, and this is my favorite, it allows you to see the smartphone view as you're building the project. As many of our online students use their smartphones to access our online content, this is an equity consideration as well. Finally, it's humanizing and personal. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds, including first-generation students, low-income students, and students of color are at greater risk of failing our online courses compared to face-to-face -to -face ones. Research shows that when students feel connected to their instructor, they do better in online courses. Digital storytelling builds empathy, and when our emotions are engaged, we retain information better. Thus, digital history can be an instrument to bring about greater equity and a way to connect specifically with our more disadvantaged students who may feel alienated from academic scholarship and unfamiliar with academic culture. I'm walking away from my year as an EPIC fellow, having grown as a researcher and teacher. I'm tremendously grateful to Stanford's EPIC family, as well as my co-fellows for making this pandemic year a productive one and one where I was able to find community. Thank you. My name is Heidi Saleh, and I'm an art history instructor at Santa Rosa Junior College. I have the great pleasure of teaching large survey courses on global art. We look at art from all over the world, from prehistoric times to contemporary times. And in this project, I was looking for ways to enliven the traditional art historical pedagogy of showing images and videos. So I wanted to explore augmented and virtual reality to see how I can utilize that um, in the classroom. So the goals of the study is to provide alternatives to traditional pedagogy and to enrich the visual experience for our students. I wanted them to be wowed, like you see this woman in this image, with the use of augmented and possibly virtual reality and really feel like they were there at the site, in the museum, in front of the work of art, at the heritage site. And so the objectives are threefold to enable students to really understand the layout and placement of ancient monuments, and more importantly, how those ancient monuments relate to their contemporary contexts. The other thing that I was really aiming for in this project was allowing access for people who are unable to go, whether for financial reasons or for actual physical disabilities that can't allow them to travel. So how can I bring the world to my students is what I was trying to do. And thirdly, I was trying to replicate the experience of visiting ancient monuments so that a student can map it out, visualize it, and feel more comfortable. Because if they're more comfortable and kind of can ex have an expectation of what they're going to see, they're more likely to actually book that trip and travel um, to that part of the world to explore. So I used the Great Pyramids at Giza, Egypt as my case study for this project, mostly because one, I was born and raised in Giza, so I was very familiar with the landscape. And secondly, because I'm an Egyptologist by training, so I'm very familiar with the ancient monuments too. So I thought this was a great place to explore the efficacy of using AR and VR. So here's an image of what we usually think about when we think about the Great Pyramids at Giza. And what I wanted to do is to challenge that notion and make it more realistic. And we typically do this in art history through images. Here you can see the huge suburb of Giza, which is a suburb of the capital Cairo, encroaching on the monuments. And this is actually the neighborhood I grew up in. And you could see, you know, Pizza Hut overlooking the pyramids. These pyramids are not in isolation as we tend to imagine them to be based on what we see in documentaries and the shots are taken from a particular angle. Um, so we wanted to just give students a more holistic understanding of the contemporary context of these monuments so that they're not surprised when they arrive there. And so I wanted to explore what's referred to as XR or extended reality. And XR is an umbrella term that covers augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. 
a lot of these I was new to as I was learning. I was kind of familiar with some of the terms, but didn't really understand the different nuances. Um, one easy way to think of it is, you know, virtual reality is where you have the headset and you're fully immersed. An augmented reality could be something that you use kind of on your phone. Um, and a mixed reality is where you're actually engaging with something virtually. And I'll go through this again in more detail. So here's an excellent example of an augmented reality where um, the, the technology morphs the physical world by projecting a virtual picture or a character. I want you to think of Pokemon age, you know, where, where kids were following these images. Or in this excellent example in Google Maps, you can see, um, again, projections of where to turn, where to go. That's augmented reality, using the physical world and then adding to it. I didn't find this particularly useful for art history, and the few things that I did find, um, like in Google Expeditions, was this aug augmented reality where you're creating an overlay of virtual content in your space. So this is in my house. Okay, sure, you can put a pyramid or you could put a statue. These are not, this is not actually a real statue, and this is not to scale. So although this was fun, I didn't really see an educational application for art history um, for augmented reality in this format. Virtual reality produces an entirely computer generated simulation of this alternate world. And there are lots of um, different levels of how well virtual reality is done. So if you look here very quickly, this is a game, for example, I found online where it's for $9.99, so it's not a very expensive one. You see the user here wearing the headset, manipulating, and trying to simulate what it's like to enter the Great Pyramid. And I also, quite frankly, did not find this very useful, um, as when they did go inside, it wasn't really a good realistic rendition. It was close, um, but of what it's like to enter the pyramid. So, Mixed reality is something actually that I can't apply to art history. I haven't found any applications, but just out of curiosity, since you're wondering what that is, it's creating a virtual object that you can actually interact with in the in the actual environment. So um, you can interact in real time with virtual objects. That would be really cool. Um, but again, no application here. What I did find really, really useful, and I think this is going to be my go-to, and I recommend this for art historians and other instructors who want to add that visual images, is I found Google Earth absolutely indispensable to my project. So kind of going back to the bases almost. Um, and what I loved about Google Earth is my ability to um, mark different locations. So if I'm going to talk about the Great Pyramids of Giza in my lecture, I could mark different things um, and walk the students through it. So if I press play here and kind of take you on this journey, um, you can see that we're gonna start our tour, if you will, at Santa Rosa Junior College, where I teach. And I love how Google Earth kind of transports you to our location to give students the sense of space, right? And going all the way here. And then I can um, I can make it a little bit personal. So this is actually my home where I grew up. And I can show them that in relation to, for example, the place where I got married. And I can even click and say to them, look, I got married in the shadows of the um, pyramids. So to give them a sense of the closeness of proximity to where people live. And then here we are looking at the monuments. And once we're at the Giza Plateau, there are wonderful features. All this in blue is where we have street view. So you don't have street view everywhere, but when you do have it, it's super exciting. And I can drop my little person in there and then we can look at what it's like to be at the ground visiting the Great Pyramids. I can turn everybody around so that they could see the different angles. Here's the entrance way so that we can have, again, a really much better understanding of the layout um, of how this all is. It does take some practice maneuvering, and it's something that instructors will have to, you know, really practice, especially if you're going live in the classroom. And then if I want to travel and go take them to the Great Sphinx, then again, I can pick up my figure, see where the Street View blue lights are, 
and then drop the figure there to give them again this wonderful perspective of being right in front of the Sphinx. And I can maneuver it in different um, directions and um, have them look, you know, sometimes closer than what they're able to access in reality. But here, this is a place that is accessible. And I just loved being able to kind of immerse the students in this environment. And to hop from one location to the next, if I want to take them to the burial of this queen, which I, I'll show you the inside of it later, um, I can, again, put it on my Google Earth list and then, boop, drop us there. And then, obviously, these images are the outside um, of the monuments, but there are other tools that will allow us to go inside these monuments as well and check everything else out inside. So here we're traveling through, and you can see really the sense of what you're going to see on the ground as you're looking at everything here, and the pyramid in the background drop. And then I can point out other things like, oh, there's going to be this great Egyptian museum, the Grand Egyptian Museum that's about to open any time now, right over there. And then I can take the students to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston because this area of the Giza Plateau was excavated by um, a joint Harvard and Berkeley, so I can take them from Boston to the Phoebe Hearst Museum uh, of Anthropology, and we can spend time at those pages looking at the actual work. So it's this wonderful way to bring everything together. Now, I realize that it's difficult to maneuver while you're teaching, so Google also um, offers what's known as Google Voyager, and Google Voyager takes you kind of, um, does it autopilot basically. So you can just talk, you can just select where you want it to take you as an instructor. And I've seen Google Voyager for all over the world. So it's really, really amazing feature. And you can just let the, you know, let them show you around as you're lecturing. So that way your hands are not on deck, occupied by trying to direct, uh, the students in various directions. So this is also a very, very exciting feature, and it can also jump you from one point to the next, um, as I was doing manually. So this is kind of autopilot, if you will. If you want to see inside, my recommendation would be to look at these 360 degrees the videos the Great Pyramid of Giza, that can really give you a sense of what it's like to go inside some of those monuments and the ability to look around as well. And this is my favorite. Matterport is my favorite. They create these really great um, simulations um, where actually it's not a simulation. It's actually here. It is a tomb, one of the tombs that I was showing you earlier, the, the Queen Maris Ankh the third. And you can see that you can kind of go in, explore. There are hot spots that you can click on and see more of. This is absolutely fantastic. My dream is to have Matterport do all ancient monuments throughout the world because um, this is just a very, very exciting feature. And I know that this is what the Cantor Museum uses at Stanford University. So um, really, really great feature to let us inside because what Google Earth and Google Voyager can't do, these um, extra steps take you inside. So in conclusion, um, Google Cardboard, I played around with that. And although the pros of it is it's very accessible, it's low cost, the cons is that it's so glitchy, I could never really get it to work. And it would be a nightmare trying to do that with 200 students in um, a classroom. And it does cause minor motion sickness. The Oculus VR headset is absolutely amazing. I think it's the best use of XR technology for education. It's an amazing simulated experience. It's interactive, but it's ridiculously expensive. So it becomes completely out of reach and also makes you feel really, really sick. Um, I had a hard time with motion sickness. So in the end, my recommendations for education, and particularly for art history, is to either utilize those 360 degrees of videos, or just stick to old fashioned Google Earth and Google Street View. Thank you for your time. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to definitely stick within the 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone, for making it today. I just want to give you an overview of what I've been working on 
uh, for the year as an EPIC fellow and uh, what came out of that project. I just want to say that initially the project was about internationalizing the American canon and it switched into or it developed into uh, uh, surveillance literature and it changed back to uh, uh, immigrant literature. It is always still working with immigrants. It's still always working with uh, novels and such, but it has undergone some processes of change and the uh, course that I have designed for my undergraduates is called Immigrants in the Age of Terror. Now, what I wanna do is uh, give you an overview of the, uh, uh, um, the disciplinary as well as the uh, general questions that I have in, uh, in, in, in uh, designing this course. And I should say that it's also coming in the context of my humanities program at SRJC uh, renewing itself after uh, uh, several years of not having new courses and such, uh, moving to online and hybrid forms and things. And one of the goals that I wanted to do as the new coordinator of the humanities program at SRJC is to ensure that we are presenting our information in a holistic, uh, global kind of way, whereas right now the way our courses are organized, uh, humanities in Asia, humanities in Africa, humanities in America, is very much organized along uh, uh, um, a very dated area studies kind of approach to uh, um, uh, studying culture. So I wanted to get away from that and multidisciplinary courses like this is a way that uh, um, um, our department is going to reinvigorate our program. So I'm interested in immigrants and violence and uh, terror. I'm also interested in different kinds of narratives and stories as well as uh, critical pedagogy specifically from the work of um, uh, Henry Giroux. The other thing that I want to note is that there's two sections to the presentation. The first few minutes will be about the pedagogy and then the second will be about the content. So I also don't know when I was preparing this, who I would be speaking to. So some of you may be in the community college system. Some of you may be new. Some of you may be like me who moved from a four year to a two year. And uh, the last several years have been a process of great learning for myself. So. Some of you may know that the community college system in California is the world's largest with 1.2 million students. Uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, about 70% are non-white, more than half are women, and uh, a good portion of community college graduates uh, transfer to four-year uh, uh, colleges within California. The other thing that I wanted to share with you about the community college uh, um, teaching environment is that it's very varied, right? There's a, uh, as an open institution, we have a lot of students from different experiences, academic preparation goals and interests. And this provides a lot of challenges for faculty. Here is the holy trinity, of course, as everybody knows of what uh, high course load. Uh, I teach five courses a year, 35 students each. Uh, uh, um, uh, five courses each semester, 35 students each. And there's also little prep time in that. Now, as a full-time tenured faculty, I have it a lot better than most of the adjuncts who do most of the teaching at our institution. 70% uh, of them have jobs elsewhere. And I think this really represents the kind of deprofessionalization of community college teaching, especially as we move from a focus on the classroom and disciplinary work into what's amorphously called by the state as student success, whatever that means. And we can talk about that later uh, as well. There's also some problems that I've found in teaching literature in the humanities classroom. One is that there's an issue of interest, right? I often hear, how long is this? Why is it so long? Two is context. It's old. Uh, uh, why are we reading this? And of course, uh, something that really gets me and that I have a challenge with every semester is students coming, coming up to me going, I don't understand, I don't get it, right? And it isn't uh, good enough for them to say, sometimes it's okay to not get it, just keep reading. Uh, you know, students aren't working always in that kind of mode of discovery, unfortunately, right? Um, I also had some several pedagogical and ethical considerations. One was to go against what is accepted common sense. And by the way, I want to pause here and just say that this project has allowed me 
to think about what goes into a course because when you're teaching a lot and you're not really, um, you don't really have time to think about why are you offering the courses that you're offering? What's motivating that, right? So I'm gonna skip through some things here and I wanna talk about the rhetorical approach that I want to employ in my class where this involves treating the various components or the voices of a literary text as not having fixed meanings, but as having, uh, uh, um, as changing depending on context, as involving situational awareness. And the goal of literature, especially in the classroom, is to help students articulate their ideas to each other as well as to themselves. So with that, I, 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 I am doing this approach to the courses that I'm offering using what's called the mirrors and windows approach of what you put on a syllabus where you try to reflect, you try to select texts that reflect students' interests and backgrounds. And certainly that was a big question when I started this project was how do we harness the information and the knowledge that our diverse body of students already have, including when it comes to literature. Lori Grobman, had a really, really interesting uh, 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 argument 30 years ago when she wrote her book in 1990. She said, I do something in my course that's really, really radical, and that's anchoring your literature course with a text written by a woman of color. So when I was designing this course on immigrants and terror, what did I had several options, but one that I chose to do was uh, this, Jamaica Kincaid's uh, Lucy, about a young girl from the Caribbean sent to uh, work as an au pair in uh, uh, um, New York City. And what I wanna do here with a few moments that I have left is to just tell you how I'm approaching this text and then quickly go through the others because there is a, a formula, I hate to say that word, uh, to this. So I'm using Jamaica Kincaid's uh, Lucy, Dear America by Jose Antonio Vargas, a quite topical book about uh, undocumented uh, um, uh, uh, young people, students, and so on, uh, from Jose Antonio Vargas, the journalist. I am also using uh, from the memoirs of a non-combatant enemy about a uh, Filipino fashion designer who's mistaken as a terrorist, and Mohsen Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist about a Pakistani kid who gets a full ride to Princeton and his life is going great until September 11th. So when I am dealing with the text, I have one question that's going to anchor our work with the students. One is, what makes us like or not like a text? And I ask this because I have used Lucy once before and the students hated Lucy. And I kept asking, you know, why do you hate her? And what we never talked about directly was she's a young black woman who has a lot of quote unquote attitude. Like she thinks that the white people she works for are just weird, their habits, their rituals, where they spend their money on and so on. So I think that one main question that anchors this section of the course is what makes us like or not like a narrator. There, these are the three uh, uh, topics or themes that I would work with with students over the course of several weeks. And this is an example of a supplementary reading that I would pair with Jamaican Kids Lucy. Uh, 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 Marita O'Bonner is a very uh, um, underrated writer from the Harlem Renaissance. And at the age of 20, she wrote a, a, a short article for The Crisis, one of the two main publications for African-Americans in the early 20th century called On Being Young, A Woman and Colored. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to cede the time to my colleague and I'm available to speak about this both in the Q&A and also as well as a uh, 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 via email and such. So thank you, everyone. I know I spoke fast, but I've also been I'm also been I've also been having problems with my internet. So I'm trying to beat time in case it it goes down again. So thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Oliver Rosales, uh, who teaches at Bakersfield College, and his the name of his presentation is I hope I get this one right this time uh, is preserving an international community through oral history and Oliver the floor is all yours. Thank you Nelson. Can you see my screen? Okay 
Um, so one resource that I developed during this fellowship period was an interactive GIS map. Um, this was administered through Survey123. Um, I think that this project both embraces an anti-racist approach as well as an international lens because the focus is on people of color, but also migrant groups that have been traditionally excluded from historical archives. Um, as a historian, I'm certainly aware that archives reflect power and who can and cannot tell historical narratives. And this of course affects the stories that we tell uh, in our classrooms, particularly in history courses, but also as Emmanuel was pointing out literature, I think students need to see themselves in history. And again, the exclusion from uh, archives is, is a real issue, right? And so this project is intended to, to challenge that. Um, the assignment that I designed uh, is an oral history family history recovery project uh, on many different levels. They do interviews, essay writing, uh, as well as a multimedia project. Um, in the rural San Joaquin Valley of Central California, where I teach, it serves a very specific purpose to try to uncover new regional archives that have been generally unexamined by scholars as well as larger history projects. And so uh, this is the GIS map. I'll come back and maybe talk about that in a moment. But I wanted to mention as a point of background, because again, this has been a, a wonderful fellowship year and um, the GIS map is, is absolutely related to this other project that I was working on. So uh, during the pandemic, we just happened to have brought the Smithsonian's traveling exhibit uh, entitled Revolution in the Fields. Um, the, the story of Dolores Sparta, and I was involved with the bringing of the physical exhibit and trying to create some kind of alternative during the pandemic. Um, and so it was really, as Heidi was indicating, uh, the folks at the Cantor who opened my eyes as to the, the potential for, um, you know, virtual museum tours. And so I was involved in securing some of the grant funding, but also trying to troubleshoot with our team uh, as to how to make this actually an engaging exhibit. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm proud of um, is that this, this exhibit is available in both English and Spanish. So as you kind of you know, br browse the museum and you click on some of the, the, the text and whatnot, um, you can see it again, available in English and Spanish. There have, there's videos embedded in here. And one of the things that I was most proud of is I was able to get some testimonials embedded into this. So, so these are all uh, students from Bakersfield College. Um, the interviews are available in both English and Spanish. And these students in particular, if you're not familiar with Dolores Sparta, um, you know, most of her work was in agricultural and um, immig immigration reform, environmental justice. So all these students uh, were impacted by these things. Um, and so they, they talk about their, their family histories and their uh, experiences working within agriculture, but also being a student. So it's really, really powerful. And again, the fact that it's both English and Spanish reflects the kind of market that we're trying to look out to. Uh, I'm also happy to, to share that um, this resource is available to the public and through some of our analytics, um, we've seen that the, the, the virtual museum is being used all across the country um, by folks like in New York and you know, um, other, other places where Dolores Sparta and the United Farm Workers were particularly um, you know, impactful. Like we can see the folks using that. So we're really, really happy about that. Um, now, circling back to um, the, the GIS, um, uh, one of the ways that I was able to connect the Dolores Huerta exhibit to what I was doing in the classroom was through a survey one, two, three. And so this again is uh, going back to, um, you know, some of our preconditioning, right? With Esri and, and ArcGIS story mapping. Um, the survey one, two, three has allowed me to survey all of my students um, on a whole host of issues, but I was trying to nail down in, in the particular where they trace their family origins. And so this was the fun part where I was able to gather that data to see where they called home, and to it, a lot of students, not a lot of students did this survey. I had like I think like a ninety percent um, rate of students actually completing this thing, but I did like a little video where I would talk about my own family's background coming from like Chihuahua, Mexico in the eighteen nineties, and so I tried to uh, explain the, the purpose of the survey and what function it was serving. And to me, the mo most exciting part, and I saw this I think in Ron's presentation is um, you know, the students were able to upload a family artifact. And so you know, every one of these dots, it's just like, for me, like I would do family history projects, but like this like visualizes it. Like you, know, you can click on a student and see like, okay, what does it mean to be from um, you know, uh, uh, like the Puerto Vallarta area or like Jalisco, or you know, what does it mean to be from the Appalachian mountains to your family? And they find something in their house to share. And, um, I was impressed with Ron's presentation with his story map. I'm definitely not there yet, but I, I do understand now fully through this experience, the connection between the story map 
and the, the GIS mapping. Like it, it's it's designed to get you to, to share that presentation in an innovative way. So I really appreciated uh, you know Ron's presentation on that and uh, my experience in this epic project. I think what my, my plan is is to do this every semester and to gather data over you know two three semesters and then maybe produce a kind of story map that tells a story about the students that I teach at Bakersfield College, which as you can see reflected in the map, like there's something about, you know, uh, Western Mexico, right? Michoacan, Jalisco, and the migration to the San Joaquin Valley, mostly through agriculture. And so as a Hispanic serving institution, I can make the case about why having a curriculum that reflects that um, is, is very important. Um, one of the way that I've been able to kind of like curate this work for my students and for the public, um, is through a Google site like um, uh, Solen was doing. Um, and so this is interesting because, you know, there, there's this tension in this project for, for me, like gathering all the data through the survey one, two, three, but then like, how do I share it with the public? Well, this becomes one of the ways I share it with the public uh, because it's really exemplary student work. So I can gather all of the data and see where students come from. And then when you have students that do excellent work, whether it's oral history or telling a certain kind of narrative, I teach them to go through the Creative Commons licensing process through YouTube. Uh, so where they're basically, you know, sharing their research with the public. And so um, this, is, this website reflects about two semesters worth of data, including this most recent one. And so I'm starting to curate these under like broad categories like, you know, citizenship, migration, transnationalism, and, and work in labor. And so each of these little um, indexes here represents a student's story of some kind. And so I, I wanna to get to the point where I can have students be involved, like, like kind of like Ron was doing, where they're doing some of the, of the labor, but I'm just not there yet. Uh, but again, I think that being as a part of this fellowship um, experience has, has, has made me kind of wed the idea of the Google site and sharing out exemplary student work with actually just kind of gathering data uh, to be able to analyze it um, over time. Um, so um, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, so the um, um, one thing I wanted to know, uh, again, uh, about the administration of the, uh, the survey one, two, three, I mentioned that it had a success rate of about 90%. Um, again, I was I, I, going forward, I would probably move that up a little bit um, to try to introduce this to them earlier in the semester. Um, I wanted to note too that, um, you know, I, I plan to share this experience with my campus uh, about using ArcGIS and Survey123. We don't have an institutional subscription. I know that we'd had uh, conversations in our, in our group before uh, about that. I'm using actually um, my local university's uh, subscription account. I think through their institutional subscription, they might have like 100 accounts that they can use and maybe like five of them were only being used. And that's, that's a, a Cal State University. So I'm, I'm, hope, I'm optimistic, right, that uh, Esri, you know, um, as I understand, they work with institutions to give you a kind of deal that 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 meets your needs. Uh, but I, I don't know why more people aren't using, you know, ArcGIS and story mapping. It's such a just an innovative way uh, to tell stories and to engage students in creating these kind of like non disposable assignments. Um, uh, another point I wanted to mention um, again about you know, like filling an archive. Um, I can't underscore the extent to which you know I, I'm trying to move away, you know, from like textbook driven courses, you know, uh, a lot of my colleagues, you know, assign textbooks that are anywhere between 100 to 150 dollars. I've tried to lower mine as much as I as I can. Uh, but this to me seems like a way where students are creating the content and driving the content in a way that, you know, I just I wouldn't have imagined unless I'd been part of this epic experience. And um, again, it's informed. Uh, it's going to take a while to measure that impact, I think, of my own pedagogy. But like, man, it's super exciting. And just something as simple as this, like I, I, I wanted to share with this particular group, like it, it, it was a milestone for me to be able to administer this survey. Like <laughs> it really was like, I had the hardest time wrapping my mind around like ArcGIS and story mapping, but then actually like doing the survey, it's really not that hard to do. And you can see like, there's just so much potential. And again, as I was listening to Ron's presentation about how, how all that data, you can have students do the, the labor, like that's what's exciting about the survey one, two, three. And I mean, it just has so, so much potential. So I really look forward to gathering, you know, data the next couple of semesters and producing a story map that really begins to tell uh, a new narrative that really doesn't exist within the central California uh, San Joaquin region about the immigration story. And as you can see, it's driven uh, a lot by immigration from Mexico, 
but again, there's uh, central and, and, and uh, Central and Southern American immigrants there and finding common ground with you know, African-American migration from Texas or rural white migration from Appalachia, I think is another uh, strategic goal I have. So uh, I think that's it, that it for today. Uh, uh, thank you so much for listening. <clears throat>